This panel discussion took place at the Newport Global Summit in Newport, Rhode Island on August 25th, 2022. The conversation was moderated by Nicholas Gavostep, Senior Fellow at Carnegie Council and co-host of the Doorstep Podcast. Welcome everyone to this special edition of the Doorstep Podcast taking place at the Newport Global Summit where we have been looking at some of the key trends of the day and likely developments for the future, particularly as we move into the fourth industrial revolution. I'd like to start by turning to uh, uh, Peter Zwack uh, to give us a sense of the crisis of the day that has dominated our discussions here today, what's happening in terms of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and perhaps if you can give us a sense of where you think things might be headed. Thank you, Nick, uh, for, for the question. Um, I think that when we look at Russia, Ukraine, we have to look at the greater world that we're in and put it into context. First of all, uh, let's think where we were on February 23rd, 2022, where there was a lot of buildup, a lot of concern, but nobody was going, nobody knew exactly what was going on and uh, there will be forever um, of, of, you know, uh, feedback and discussion about that. Bottom line is that there was an aggression in the, if you will, the European civilization that we haven't seen uh, since of the likes of Stalin and Hitler uh, invading Poland in 1939. Uh, and what is remarkable when we look out at the future and the way ahead, I believe there's several outcomes I do not have uh, I can't guess on it, but there is no easy path and there is no well-defined path. There will ultimately be a solution and God knows what that's going to be. Uh, I think the most important thing in all of this is that we have seen the head of um, militant autocracy, um, uh, militant autocracy on a massive scale, arise in Russia in regards to Ukraine, but you have also seen, as in the 1930s, early 1940s, you have also seen sort of like-minded, free-minded nations rise to the defense of a nation that was under a heavy assault that has pulled together and shocked the world by the spirit and will of their resistance and kind of exposed what it's for, an autocratic totalitarian nearly nation to invade and try to fight and occupy the land of a supported uh, uh, nation. How it's going to end, don't know. I, I think the Ukrainians have got to have a chance to fight for the lands, first of all, lost uh, since 24 February. Uh, there's a lot of dialogue out there, but most importantly is much of the world has pulled together and then finally there's a lot out there still uh, with other autocratic nations that are watching this very closely, including the People's Republic of China and how this was all changed. A lot has changed since the 23rd of February, but what is good to see is that some of our key structures held together, at least for now. So what we have, uh, thank you, Peter, the invasion of Ukraine, I think, uh, demonstrated that uh, some of the economic ties, assessments about supply chains, assessments about reliability of goods and services, starting with energy, and we saw that uh, uh, in uh, Ghassan Abdul Karim's presentation about the geopolitical impact of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine on global energy supplies. But what is this doing uh, as we move forward in terms of what we're seeing in terms of both companies and investors. Are we going to see changes away from uh, existing supply chains? Is it going to be we can no longer rely on uh, countries like Russia or China for rare earths, minerals, key commodities, computer chips, and energy? Where do you think that all of this is heading in terms of what you see and anyone else uh, at the table? First, in terms of short term, but also, is this going to be a spur for the long term for next generation technologies that perhaps we've gotten used to a way of doing things, but that the invasion of Ukraine plus the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic will lead us to change in ways in which we think about water, food, uh, about health, about where we get uh, our things from. 
So I want to turn it over to other members of the panel uh, around us uh, for uh, any uh, of your thoughts on that. This is Todd Rupert. Thanks for the good question. Uh, you mentioned technological change. Uh, despite the fact that we've had a difficult geopolitical situation and economic situation that we're currently in, we are still in a sustained golden age of innovation led by transformational technological advances that will impact every industry and disrupt every industry. <coughs> Disruptors are, on, are entrepreneurs, they're venture capital backed, and having some allocation to venture capital on a global basis is an intelligent thing to do in this environment. Well, Roland, uh, Vandermeer, uh, can you perhaps talk about innovation and disruption uh, in terms of, uh, as you've noted, we're in a period of climate shift. Uh, the Ukraine war has brought to the fore uh, that uh, global food supplies and global fertilizer supplies are both imperiled. Uh, are there technological ways forward where we can increase food production in a time of greater drought, a greater time of water shortage, and in a time perhaps when fertilizers uh, will be uh, uh, harder to get? Yes, this is Roland Vermeer, CEO of Terra. Um, I would address the question in a couple ways. One, I think the time has come that we change the existing systems and structures that we have. Innovation is needed urgently to get off of the resource extraction from this planet and actually work with nature to kind of overcome and work with and become the humans we are together through our hearts and how we work together. So what Aptera has done is actually solving problems of water and how we bring inputs and fertilizer to the market, which are two critical variables with drought, systemic drought, and systemic inflation everywhere. So we talk about productivity. By doing this, we think, this is just one example of many in all the industries that I see coming down the road of how we're going to change the systems we're in today. And as I mentioned before, we probably have less than 25 years to figure this out. The war is a culmination of many things happening. Things are going geopolitically. It's all about resource scarcity all around the globe. So we have to figure this out urgently. And that's what Upterra is helping do in agriculture and water right now. Uh, resource scarcity, uh, shifts, war, all of these things also then have an impact not only on industry but on people, and health is becoming a greater issue. Uh, also, this is part of people, uh, we're dealing with the outgrowth of the poly pandemic, not just simply COVID, but other conditions. Uh, and we're also dealing with a legacy pharmaceutical and healthcare system, uh, which may not be uh, optimally uh, designed for meeting the challenges of the 21st century. So Aditya, if I could perhaps uh, turn the floor to you to talk about some of the things we may expect in how we can expect uh, health care to be more preventative and more tailored to our, our individual needs as we move forward. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, indeed. The pandemic has really shown the limitations of heart medicine. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, of the 10,000 or so human diseases, we barely treat 500 today, and most of them badly. Uh, we really need a fundamental change in the efficiency of every therapeutic intervention, be able to come up with better drugs than we can today through our current trial and error process. And all of that is ba uh, really, really needed for our society to turn the corner and being able to support our populations across the globe for overall, you know, increase in global health, in people's productivity, as they can, uh, so they can live longer, healthier lives. Okay, and for that, we need uh, certain kinds of technology-driven, computer-driven solutions, where we can come up with new drugs on the computer, atom by atom, then make them in the laboratory, carry them forward to testing. That is the future, uh, where uh, the world will be able to treat diseases the way we often think of the future. Anything happens, we take a pill with little fanfare, we can treat them. That's where the world needs to go. And there are some fundamental big innovations coming that will change the horizon of what we can expect from medicine. So we have new things towards health. We have new things on food security. Uh, if I can turn uh, over to Michael to bring in the energy security question, because as we see uh, both concern about hydrocarbons, 
uh, as we sent, again saw from uh, Ghassan's uh, presentation that uh, investment in new forms of energy is what's dominating, at least in, in some of the sovereign wealth funds. Uh, but this also speaks then to a need to be able to construct uh, the batteries that will store uh, electrical power. And it also means, uh, as we discussed uh, earlier, about the supply chains, who controls uh, the vital metals and minerals for which the energy transition could take place. So if I could ask you for your thoughts on what you see moving forward in terms of both the energy transition, but also securing the supply chain so that, as Peter mentioned, it doesn't necessarily run through the axis of autocracies, that our energy security doesn't rest on the whims, perhaps, of uh, governments that may not have uh, our best interests at heart. Sure, Nick. Well, you're exactly right. This is a fundamental challenge that's going on right now. We have, we have this massive disruption in two of the biggest sectors of all time. We have the transportation sector being completely disruptive, disrupted with electric vehicles, and we have energy storage changing the way we think about power and be able to store the uh, renewable powers, power on, in batteries. Now, the problem is, you know, the U.S. has not been taking this challenge to heart. We have been watching as our rivals dominate and, and take over all of the supply of the raw materials that, um, that make up these batteries. Well, we're here to try to help that. We have a, a U.S. company called U.S. Strategic Metals. We believe that we can mine safely, low carbon, low emission, and even more importantly, we can process here in America to make these electric vehicle batteries. We're doing cobalt, copper, and we're also doing um, lithium and nickel, and we're recycling batteries. I mean, globally, China controls that market. It is a, it's a fundamental mistake made by Western countries. You, you name it, it's VW, Mercedes, Ford, Tesla, all of them currently dependent on Chinese production of cobalt sulfate, nickel sulfate for the batteries. We've got to do something about it. We've got to break that supply stranglehold. And I think we're a company that's, that's trying to do it, but we need everybody involved. This is a resource cold war that's going on right now. We just have not been participating in it. So if I can then ask about where the investment picture picks in, is there is the money there? Are the investors there? Will we be able to see the direction of the resources into the new technologies, the new supply chains, uh, and will the uh, the markets be able to allocate that capital in the time frame, as Roland said, where we don't actually have unlimited time, perhaps, to to get these uh, new technologies uh, rolled out of <clears throat> development and and into the field. Well, there's more um, capital than ever, right? And there's, 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 I think, more willingness to take risk with a larger amount of capital than ever because we've come off just such a run of technology that has created a massive amount of wealth. But, you know, I think if you look at all the challenges that we've, you know, talked about today, all of the um, headwinds and all of the things that could go wrong, you know, we're all kind of a, a similar generation. You know, we grew up where we had to actually go, you know, take a stack of paper, read through to find knowledge and things like that. The generation below us has walk, been walking around with a supercomputer in their pocket since birth almost, right? And so when you look at the speed of innovation that's happening, when we talk about it with agriculture, we talk about it with minerals, we talk about actually even more and how it took almost lightning speed for the world to rally around a country that was, I mean, it took years for, to, to rally around um, uh, the, the, the right cause in Europe in World War II. So things happen faster. I think knowledge is, is being gained faster. So I'm talking about my kids are 15 and 17 years old. They never want for knowledge. Boom, in two seconds they have it. And so the human mind is you know, accelerated faster and faster. And this is why we have AI, and this is a great tech in agriculture, in biosciences, and things like that. So I'm, I'm long humans. <laughs> I think these challenges that have seemed surmountable all the way dating back to World War II to now, we, we keep rising to the challenge, right? I mean, it, it took 16 car batteries to power the first easy go golf cart, and it wouldn't quite last 18 holes of golf. Now we have battery technologies that weigh about the same, have new technology within them, can take a three ton truck for 
560 miles. So if you look at the advances of technology and where we're headed on all these fronts and everything we've talked about today, the money's there to, be had, uh, to, to get behind these ideas. There's more innovation, but I think the, the human spirit behind it has never been more awakened because everyone also, because of the, these things, and really holding up a mobile phone, um, is, is um, incredible because everyone who wants to have a voice can have one. Citizen journalists, people who are very into from, I'll spend from, um, uh, you know, venture capital to agriculture to biosciences to yoga to whatever it might be has found a voice here. So I think sometimes the biggest headwinds we challenge is getting our governments and sovereigns and everything in line with what the human spirit or what the human, you know, drive and, and where humans are taking it. And now, you know, with everyone having such a voice and such a, you know, being heard, I think that's even changing faster than ever. So the, the answer really is I don't know, but be, for all those reasons, I have a lot of confidence that the next decade or two um, is gonna really see us starting to nail down cures for cancer, uh, you know, absolute uh, straight paths to uh, clean and renewable energies as, as a viable, real viable choice. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm long humanity here, I think. I think this will all work out, but it's never without some challenges. You know, it still took, I was I'm amazed at this one. It took, man, almost three, 4,000 years to put wheels on a suitcase, right? That didn't come out like late 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. So every once in a while, we don't get there and we don't meet the challenge in, in a timely way. But with all the things that, you know, have, have transpired in the last, you know, 150 years and where we are today from technological advances, the amount of capital, the people who are involved in getting behind growth, and, and innovations, and then just the human spirit, free flow of information. Um, I think we're headed in a great you know, direction, not without headwinds, not without some challenges, but um, we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, hi, Elizabeth from Strange Lab Perfumes. A little bit off the topic of high technology healthcare breakthroughs, but I do feel that the power of scent is pretty important as well. Um, we're going through a lot of stress. It's been, you know, really tough few years. Everybody said they're, you know, have given us their opinion on wars and inflation, and you know, it's a tough, it's a tough time, especially after COVID. And I like to think that, you know, the perfumes that I make lighten up people's feelings and brings back will bring back lovely memories and just take them off transport them to another place where they can just you know enjoy the beautiful scents and and feel optimistic about the future on that uh point uh, about uh, maybe we can give a last word to our uh, two co-authors uh uh, Nathan Lewis and Elizabeth Ames to, to give us a sense of uh, where things are headed with the money and, uh, and will we be able to uh, uh, get around some of the inflationary pressures we've been seeing or, but also will this also reflect as some of our other speakers have noted uh, are we going to see some changes that perhaps the way we've been doing things uh, in the recent past will not be what we'll be doing in the future so your, your thoughts. Well, I think everyone around the table would agree that uh, on the, if we look at the, the bright side of innovation and entrepreneurialism and capital, capitalism at its best, also our institutional and government leadership is probably the worst of living memory and it looks like it, that it's not going to turn around right away. And unfortunately, uh, countries have gotten into this problem many times in the past and it often has fairly predictable outcomes, although timing is difficult. Uh, but I would also remember that we also, the United States, not only had hyperinflation in the 1780s, but uh, we also created the great solutions that all the world copied. So if we stumble and even fall, uh, we will come back better than ever. Power of innovation. So. I would like to echo that and, and add to it that this is a unique period of time uh, compared to the 70s, where they were, the last inflation was during the 1970s. But uh, in contrast, today, we have the internet and the ability to self-educate and live with a news story in a way that we were not able to uh, 40 years ago. And as a result, I think that there 
is a much greater awareness, uh, even though we're often deriding uh, younger people about their, you know, they're not that uh, informed, but actually I think we are informed. And I think that the pain of the coming uh, couple of years, I mean, this is, we all agree they're headwinds, and I think that this is gonna open up an opportunity for innovation in money. Uh, we've already seen cryptocurrencies, which is partly a response to the uh, the last 20 years of, of the base in currency and the last 50 years before, you know, in, in general of fiat currency. So I think now, when the, if the pain gets too great, we're going to start to look for solutions uh, like stabilizing currency and perhaps even uh, gold, which has been something that's been rendered a crank subject uh, by the cancel culture of the economics profession, but that may soon change. So I think to... I would just like to end up uh, by saying a few things. First of all, a summit like this is a very important, and the importance of it is the two-way communication. Now, I'm looking at Peter. I'm sure Peter, he doesn't see what is behind him. And I don't see what is behind me. If we exchange this, we see things better, we communicate better, and distraction is very easy to do. And that's what we've been seeing in these days. And construction is take a long time, but with communication, understanding, and planning. I always say, plan your work and work your plan, you will end up to a better life. And we are all human, you know, if we don't use this, which God puts it at the top of our head, you know, he is the creator, he could put it here, or place it in the place of the heart and put the heart there. But with this we start, then we see, and then we communicate. We will have a better life. And through conferences like this, and that's why I always push Kitty, don't think of not doing this again. Continue. Because with us meeting together, with us understanding each other, we can make the world better and have much more value for our living and for our future generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, doing this to extend the conversation of the summit beyond this room to uh, a much larger audience. Thanks.